So I just wanted to have a little chat. Um, well, I'll introduce myself first. Um, my name is Jenny. I've been fixing sewing machines for about nine years. It all started out because I kept buying machines on Gumtree and eBay and then figuring out how to use them. And then I'd get bored of them and pass them on and then buy another one. And mostly they were really old, uh, you know, anything from 1930s onwards. And um, and then people started saying, oh, you know, people, students would say, oh, I've got a sewing machine at home. It's not working very well. And I said, oh, I'll have a look at it for you. And I realized that most of the problems are the same problems over and over and over again. A lot of them are user error or you know, they don't know that you can put a different bobbin in a sewing machine and that will make it not work at all, for example, or that, you know, the quality of the thread that you use in your machine can make a huge difference to how it behaves. So, and then I started, you know, just fixing people's sewing machines um, as well as still teaching sewing classes. And um, especially during lockdown, it's been very interesting because it seems everyone is both gardening and baking and sewing. And lots of people have come to me with broken sewing machines and some of them it's because they hadn't been used in 10 years or had never been used very well or they'd been passed on um you know and been sitting in a cupboard for a long time other people have been using the sewing machines very heavily people have been making scrubs and masks and scrub bags or just stuff for themselves so um lots of sewing machines are struggling because they've been used in a way that they've not been used before um and other machines just are used by people that don't maybe ordinarily use them very much at all you know the, the, the occasional seen here or there so um i've been fixing a lot of sewing machines i've fixed 12 just in the last week um which has been lovely but i very much believe that everyone can fix their own sewing machines as long as they're um you know they're in possession of some sewing machine oil and a flat small flat head screwdriver you can do an awful lot um so Jenny, just yeah that's a great intro so should we just for those who are just joining fix fest for the first time should we just yeah. do a quick welcome to them um yeah and then you can come on straight in does that make sense yeah of course yeah <laughs> okay. yeah absolutely so yeah and so welcome to fix fest for those i see there's probably a lot of people joining um for the first time from in wales and scotland across uh england um, I have I, I've been I've had a bit of a tough connection. Is there anybody from Northern Ireland joining us? Well, we know there's. Oh yeah, there we are from um, Lawrence from Belfast. So brilliant! We've got people from across the UK joining, and that's excellent. Um, FixFest has been running since the beginning of June, and it will run till July 9th. And this is kind of what we hope to be one of the kind of more hands-on sessions. So um, and people have sent in some um, questions or problems they have with sewing machines. So that's awesome. Um, and uh, we'll have a couple more sessions before the end, just announcing those. Um, we'll be having kind of like a lightning talks, demos, show and tell, bring us your story session on Thursday coming up. Um, and there'll be another uh, session a uh, week today on, uh, hosted by Repair Cafe Belfast on um, storytelling and repair and the importance of stories. And the last session will be about our repair data um, and actually, there are quite a few sewing machines in our repair data over the years. We should have taken a look at that. Okay, Just before let's get it's started. Your turn, we'll add you as a speaker, and then you can refresh. Brilliant. And let's get started, Jenny. Thanks so much for yeah. joining. And yeah. just a, just a quick introduction. So Jenny's pretty humble, but um, I think she's an amazing. Ex basically, become an expert in um, teaching sewing sewing machines, um, helping people based out of her, um, it's her garden studio, right? In, uh, in Walthamstow in London. And we met yeah. Jenny a couple of years ago. She helped us host one of our most popular skill shares ever, which was sewing machine repair. It was and, such um, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. It was really brilliant. And it really united some of the electromechanical repairers mm -hmm. and the textile repairers, which was brilliant. And you can find uh, most of the kind of documentation from that session is actually on our wiki as well. So we'll share that later on as well. But over to Jenny. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, so I'm really into empowering people to fix their own sewing machines. Um, most of it isn't particularly difficult. I'd say 80% of the issues that people come to me with are really, really, really simple. They're the same things over and over again. Um, a lot of it is user error. Um, some of it is just... Uh, rubbish sewing machines um so that's something to definitely keep in mind but even on rubbish sewing machines um oh i've lost james and janet now what's going on i'm all on my own now i'll just keep going i presume you can all hear me still we're oh, still here then yeah that's fine <laughs> technology hey um 
Yes, yeah, so uh, like I said, most of the issues are just the same over and over again. So if I can just address some simple stuff, you know, some real basics. There's also, um, I've left uh, quite a few notes um, which explain pretty much all the things that I'm talking about and even some things that I'll probably forget to mention. And there's um, also a link to my website. So I've put up, I've been doing, since lockdown, I've been um, just recording little videos on how to fix basic things on sewing machines. Um, things that, you know, people couldn't get to me with their sewing machines because of lockdown or people couldn't get to me full stop because they're not local. Um, and I thought I'm just going to show people in little five or ten minute videos how to do stuff that they can't just do themselves. And obviously, if there's anything more complex, then feel free to ping me a message. But I think the basic idea is that, you know, not everybody's sewing machines are created equal. So some sewing machines just have rubbish straight out of the box. It's as simple as that. They are just, you know, they're good for, to be looked at when they're first purchased. And then, but actually they're not, they're kind of disposable. So a lot of sewing machines, you know, if you think about it, back in the 40s or whatever, people used to spend a month's wages on a sewing machine. So now we expect a 60 pound sewing machine to do exactly that, you know, exactly the same things that that sewing machine that would otherwise cost us now. I don't know. What does the average person earn in a month? Quite a lot, you know, and it just doesn't work like that. You can't spend 60 quid on a sewing machine and expect it to work perfectly you can't expect it to work all the time you can't expect it to last either and so therefore you know spending 60 quid on some machine is actually if that's all you can afford then yeah i get it but stretch to 100 pounds and you can get a machine that is vaguely decent and that comes with a warranty um if you can stretch to a little bit more if you can't buy a vintage sewing machine if you can i mean you can get for you know 60 quid you can get an amazing all metal sewing machine that might not be able to embroider ducks or your name or something on your clothes but it will do what it does beautifully and consistently and it will work all day without complaining so um that is definitely something to be to to look at and if you need any advice on buying sewing machines online again just ping me an email i'm always really happy to help because you know machines back in those days were made to last and most of them are still around um you know i always say about into sewing machines the only way to kill them is to throw them out of the window uh all down the stairs uh or to hand them to a crappy courier company and they will do that for you which i have has happened to me a few times um but on the whole they're indestructible so you know you just put a bit of oil on them and they're purring away and they will last another 40 50 years um you can't expect that of a sewing machine that you buy now all the parts are plastic even the expensive ones and they just wear out and the cheap ones sometimes are worn out before you even get them out of the box and other times they last six months or a year and then that's kind of it and then you have to buy another one so um but i just want to have a quick chat about the basic things that people come to me with that are, um, I mean, user error sounds a bit uh, pejorative, really. I just, you know, I just kind of mean that these are all things that people don't generally know are an issue, um, but actually can really affect the way your sewing machine works. So when people come to me, it's usually because uh, the stitch tension is wrong. So you might get bits of um, thread hanging out underneath your work, or occasionally you get thread snapping or, um, you know, other tension issues or fabric puckering but it's more often than not loops underneath your work um, and this is often fixed by um, uh, the uh, just some basic issues so first of all you need to replace your needle regularly so buy good quality needles lots of needles are kind of blunt or damaged when you even buy them so it's definitely not worth skimping on get the decent quality needle I've left in the notes um, the details of the brand that I buy and they're consistently good so don't be tempted to buy them on the market or in the pound shop or whatever often they are blunt or damaged before you even start your needle needs to be super sharp in order to pierce the fabric and to pick up the bobbin thread at the right time so if your needle is blunt it will take longer to get through the fabric and by the time it gets through to where it needs to be it's slightly late and it's not picking up the bobbin thread properly and that's when you get issues such as um, stitches that are skipped um but also you can get tension issues so that you have threads underneath your work or thread sitting on top or if your needle is really damaged it can even break your thread as you're sewing so definitely check your needle so what i always do i use my pinky finger or my ring finger because they're not calloused like the others and just run it along the point of the needle 
make sure that you don't feel any roughness at all, just feel completely super sharp. And then literally just run your finger up the needle to make sure that to test whether it's still picking up the edge of your skin. If it doesn't do that, replace your needle, okay? So there is just nothing to be gained by carrying on with a needle that's damaged or blunt because it will just carry on causing issues. So this is a huge thing. Most of the sewing machines that come to me with tension issues, I change the needle and then they're good as gold again. Um, second thing that's really important is decent thread. So it doesn't have to be expensive thread. I'll try and show you some of the thread I use, which is super cheap. Uh, where, are we, where are we at now? Okay, so this stuff here, it's called Coates Moon Thread. I buy it on the market, 70p for, I don't know, 500 meters. So it doesn't really get an awful lot cheaper than that. But it's decent enough quality for most things that you're sewing. Not for dressmaking. For dressmaking, you want more expensive stuff. So I tend to use, I don't know if you can see that. This is called Gutemann. Um, and if you buy Gutemann polyester thread, it's super, super, super lovely, and your machine will love you for it. It will purr away when you're using it. However, this is about one pound eighty for a hundred meters, whereas the other one's about seventy p for five hundred meters. So use this for special, but not for everything. There's no need to waste expensive thread on cheaper projects. But anything else, so thread from the pound shop, thread from you know you get those cards with you know a hundred different colors for a couple of quid. Rubbish you know variety boxes on amazon where they give you scissors and a measuring tape and threads total rubbish literally none of it is usable the scissors aren't sharp the needles aren't sharp the threads are rubbish so don't use those on your sewing machine they're not good quality they are often quite thin often the tension on them is really inconsistent as well so you have lumps in them and you have thin bits and thicker bits so as that goes through your machine the tension just is all over the place. Um, the other thing to definitely not use is old thread. So older threads, anything you've inherited from your granny or whatever, um, people tended to only use cotton threads back in the day and cotton rots. So over time, the threads are, um, the, the strength is just completely gone. So often when you get a cotton thread and you just pull it a little bit, it snaps instantly. Now, when you are using your sewing machine, there's a lot of tension put on your threads and you need polyester thread, end of. You can't use cotton threads on sewing machines, not even modern cotton threads. They're still not strong enough to be used on sewing machines. So they're great for hand sewing, but I don't use them on my sewing machine at all. So good thread is really important, really, really massively important. Often people come to me with broken sewing machines and then I go, what's this thread? And they go, I don't know, my mum gave it to me or I found it or charity shop or whatever. So that's not the way to go. Um, the other really important thing is make sure you've got the same quality thread on your top thread as you do on your bobbin because your machine can tell the difference. If you've got something lovely and expensive on your bobbin and then you're using some old, old nonsense on the top, your machine will struggle to balance out the tension because it's got tension system in the bobbin as well as the tension system on top. And if the two are different, it will just be constantly trying to adjust and it just won't work very well. So always make sure that your bobbin has the same thread as your top thread doesn't need to be the same color color machines are color blind but it does need to be the same quality so it may well be worth only using one particular brand always and just buying a few colors in that so you're not constantly guessing what's on your bobbin although over time you get to recognize what a good quality thread looks like even when you're just looking at it so that's really important the other thing i wanted to talk about is bobbins there is just loads of different sizes of bobbins so just expecting any old bobbin to work in your particular machine doesn't really work like that so again people come to me with broken sewing machines and i take the bobbin out and i go what's this bobbin where did this come from and they go i don't know i just found it or my mum gave it to me or whatever or i bought it in the pan shop now that doesn't work because actually if your bobbin doesn't fit your bobbin case perfectly if it's too small it will wibble around and it will cause tension issues and if it's too big it doesn't spin around at all or if it's too tall it will catch on things and if it's too low it will again wobble around so it's really important that you make sure you've got the correct bobbin for your machine if you don't know google it find out what there's pages and pages on you know wikipedia written about what machines take what bobbin so it's really really important that you have the correct bobbin for your machine because again this can cause big tension issues too 
Um, the other thing is, even if it's the correct bobbin for your machine, it might not be a good quality. So plastic bobbins, especially, they can get warped over time. They can get damaged. Some, you, somebody might have stood on it. Some cheap bobbins are a rubbish too. They have like spikes on them and roughness and they catch the thread. And I've even, I've bought some bobbins and they were a decent make, I thought. And um, the center hole in the bobbin was too small to go on the bobbin windings ball. So you couldn't use them. I mean, what's the point of a bobbin if you can't wind any thread onto it? So do, again, don't skimp on bobbins. They're not expensive. They're like a pound each. You don't need hundreds. So don't try and buy, you know, 20 for a pound in the pound shop. In fact, don't buy anything so related to the pound shop. <laughs> There's just nothing they sell should go anywhere near your beloved sewing machine. End of. Right. So that's the thing you need on your sewing machine. Um, uh, so if if you've tried all those things, if you've changed your needle, you've got decent thread on there, you've definitely got the correct bobbin and your machine is still playing up and you've still got tension issues. Um, and I know I keep banging on about it, but this is probably 80 percent of what I do is fixing tension issues. It could be that your bobbin case. Let me see if I can get one out and show you. So there's two different bobbin systems. One of them is the front loading where you put your bobbin in a metal bobbin case and the whole area around a bobbin is all metal and you can take it all out and clean it etc i much prefer those to the other one so the other option is a top loading bobbin system where you've got a little see-through plastic cover you drop your bobbin in there good thing is you can see how much thread is on your bobbin which is obviously quite useful because you know with these ones you don't know that you've run out until you've run out because you can't see them however this is metal the other ones are plastic. The other ones, you can move them. They've got a bit of play in them anyway. If you accidentally pull a bit too hard on them, you can shift the whole thing around and carry on stitching and you end up stitching into your bobbin case and it's just disastrous. So even a lot of expensive machines now are using those drop-in bobbin cases. Be extremely careful with them. They are not very um, strong and you can't also you can't really easily replace them these bobbin cases you can buy a new one for a fiver and anyway they're metal they just don't break but if they do you can just sort them out so you can buy a new one and the whole bobbin area generally speaking you can just open the bobbin case you can undo the little handles and you, you can um clean everything out in there which is really important so um, but if you do need to adjust the tension on your bobbin case, then there's a video on my website showing you how to do it. It's basically, once you've got your, let me see if I can show you actually, I probably can. I don't know if it's hugely clear on my camera, but when your bobbin is threaded up and it's in your bobbin case like that, you should be able to hang it like that. And then when you jiggle it, of course it's not going to play ball now, when you jiggle it a little bit, it should just gently drop down. That means that the tension is correct. If it instantly just drops down, your tension on your bobbin case is too loose. And if it doesn't drop down at all, the tension on your bobbin case is too tight. So I don't know if you can see this. There's a little screw here, and that screw adjusts the um, the uh, bobbin tension. So tiny little flathead screwdriver, or if you have strong thumbnails, you can do it with that too. Um, just have a little play. Have a little play, adjust it a little bit, see if it then changes it. Um, put it back in your machine, try and sew with it. It's not an exact science, just have a little wriggle of the tension and it will often just make things a lot better. Okay, but if you need a bit more advice, there's a video on my website just showing you exactly how to adjust the tension. Now, bobbin tension is something that's set in the factory. So on a brand new machine, if you have a vaguely decent machine, it should just be fine. And then your top tension should be on four and the two should play nicely together. However, most machines aren't checked in the factories anymore. You, you buy a 60 quid sewing machine, no one's looked at that thing. They've literally just finished it and put it in a box. So it could well be that your bob intention isn't set properly. So you may well have to have a little play with it. Generally, once your tension is fine, it takes an awful lot of sewing to jiggle that screw to become too tight or too loose. So you probably don't need to change it again for another 10 years or so, unless you are you know, machining for a living on your sewing machine. Um, which brings me to the other thing that I get a lot of people who think you can use a 100 pound domestic sewing machine as an industrial sewing machine and you just can't because they're not made for it. All the bits are plastic, all the bits just wear out over time and the more play you get in there, the more your tension starts playing up and then other things start going wrong and then when you have a computerized machine, it starts getting, sending you all kinds of error messages. You just basically can't. It's not 
dust, just that they don't have the motor size, but the bits just aren't up to it. So if you are wanting to run a business making kids clothes or you are, I don't know, whatever you want to do, you want to spend hours and hours and hours sewing every day, you cannot do that on a cheap plastic sewing machine. It just doesn't work. And even if you spend 600 quid on the plastic sewing machine, it still isn't meant for being used all day, every day. So industrial machines, that's where they come into their own. They're all metal. They've got huge motors and they are quite happily working away all day. But of course, they take up a lot of space. So they're not even particularly expensive. You know, you can pick them up on Gumtree for a couple of hundred quid, but they take up a huge space because they're in their own table um the alternative that for that for most people is a vintage sewing machine so i keep hanging on about them but they're just great because they are all metal and the motors are quite happy to purr all day usually um and if the motor goes you just bolt a new motor onto the back because they're all the bits are replaceable and they are because they're solid you know not just the bits inside are metal the whole machine is metal they have a lot of piercing power. They are not jiggled off the table by a pair of curtains or a heavy bit of fabric. They will sew your jeans. They will fix your curtains. I know people that make sales on their domestic sewing machine on, you know, their old one, not anything new like that. I kill the beautiful computerized sewing machine um, by making a pair of jeans on it. It just wasn't up to it at all, especially not computerized ones. They get out of sync really easily. So if you want to use something as an industrial sewing machine, then either buy an industrial or buy a vintage sewing machine. Um, okay, so what else have we got on here? Um, vintage sewing machines, same things as all other sewing machines. So you should be able to use the same needles. You should be able to use the same feet. They are generally completely interchangeable, which is fantastic. Um, they might have extra bits that you can't access in modern sewing machines. So on on vintage sewing machines the belt the belt that drives the whole thing is generally on the outside and it's really easy to see when the belt has become stretched or or it isn't gripping anymore or it's snapped you just go on ebay and buy a new one and they're like a fiver or eight quid or something and you just type in your you know the details of your sewing machine and then it comes up as hurrah you know this is your belt and buy it and then you get it and because it's all on the outside you just literally put it back on and then you fixed your sewing machine um the other thing that vintage sewing machines usually have is little rubbers they're about that big that go around the bobbin winding rubber so they go around the bobbin winding mechanism that then hooks up to your um hand wheel and so when you're winding up the bobbin but those bobbin winding rubbers you know, it's rubber, they, it perishes. Sometimes they get really super smooth, so they're not gripping anymore. And sometimes they're just knackered and you have to replace them. Again, they're just a couple of quid, totally easily findable on eBay. Everyone's still making them. Um, you just need to put in the diameter of them. Um, and the other thing you can sometimes do, you can sometimes rough them up a bit with just a nail file. You just rub, or some sandpaper, you just rub it all over the outside of your rubber and it will grip again so that's definitely worth trying before you replace them um one final thing i wanted to say is that you know people are always presuming not all people lots of people presume if you have a singer sewing machine you need singer needles and you need singer feet but you don't because they're all the same so even john lewis they sell the same sewing machine foot for a brother for a genome for a singer they're all exactly the same and the only thing that is different is is the name on the box and the only other thing that's different is the price so a normal sewing machine foot that's labeled genome or brother will set you back 20 quid and if you go on ebay and buy an unbranded one it will be a fiver and it will be exactly the same foot made in the same factory just better value so um of course you can buy rubbish feet but whether they have genome on them or not is not it doesn't stop them being rubbish anyway and um, same with needles so i only buy schmetz needles it's a german brand they're absolutely amazing you do not need genome needles or singer needles or brother needles they are literally no better and often they're worse and they're generally far more expensive so um with all these things most sewing machines take completely uh you know universal feet universal needles and just have a little shop around or ask me you know, I'm so not into people spending money just because it's got a brand name on it. Um, I think that's about it. Let's see if any questions have come up. Okay, service. Yeah, this is a really good question. Sorry, I'm, I'm scrolling down from the bottom up. Yeah, so people often go, oh, my machine hasn't been serviced in a while. Can you service my sewing machine? Now, modern sewing machines can't be serviced. There isn't, there's nothing really you can do. So what you can do for your machine is 
keep on top of the needle. If the needle gets blunt, you change it. It's really easy to change your sewing machine needle. It tells you in the handbook or you can Google it or I can show you. So change your needle regularly. Keep the machine clean and keep it covered up. So when you're not using it, chuck a tea towel over it or a bit of fabric or make yourself a nice cover or what have you because they attract dust and a load of dust inside eventually will, or fluff, will eventually just solidify it a bit. But modern sewing machines, you can't oil them. There is no serviceable part inside. It's almost impossible to get the plastic casing off. If you do want to get in, you end up breaking bits off because they're not meant to be taken apart. So not really, no. I mean, if somebody tells you they've serviced your sewing machine, probably all they've done is tightened up the bob intention, put a new needle in it and given it a bit of a dusting. So, you know, I'm not into charging people money for doing that because you can just do that yourself. Yes. Real competition in the aftermarket parts. Well, as is everything, right? I mean, <laughs> this is capitalism at its best. Right. Yeah, so, well, it, do, it doesn't work. So, so Jenny, just uh, we have a, like a, a stack of questions for you. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to figure out whether we can, whether maybe James, you can confirm if people can turn their mics on and video. I don't see how to invite anybody on I, right now. I, I can make people speakers to come. Okay, I'm just that video and stuff. Well, okay. you're doing well, let's, just let's, let's take the, the questions from um, Jenny. I'll, I'll feed you the questions. So, yeah, um, we've got, um, let's see, Anne in the chat, um, a couple of people in the chat actually. Um, I prefer not to use, uh, well, well, there's a question about polyester threads. If, can you, let's see, James, do you want to yeah. add environmentally? Uh, or yeah. why don't we just see if we can get them to come and ask oh, yeah, the question? Course. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, and um, sure. And there's um, uh, well also um, uh, scary boots and Mark Irving asked similar question or you know had similar questions about whether there are non kind of hundred percent poly alternatives for threads. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anne, if you're in the chat, can you refresh your window and then you should be able to share your camera and audio if you'd like to ask your question to Jenny directly. And um, so just try refreshing. And then at the bottom, you should see um, some controls to do that. In the meantime, I'll try and add uh, who are the next two, Janet? Uh, yeah, well, both Mark Irving and Scary Boots had similar questions potentially about. Um, and then there was, um, uh, OK, there's, yeah, Scary Boots also had a question about uh, a, a machine she'd like to revive. Um, there was a question about. Um, the somewhat dreaded overlocker, which I only learned about through our friends <laughs> in Australia. Um, that question is from Sarah. Sarah, I'm assuming that's the same Sarah. If you can ask. I'm sure my computer doesn't have a camera. Okay, Mark, why don't, why okay, don't, why don't, we, have, um, why don't we take Mark's question because he says he's camera shy and doesn't want to come okay. on camera. Okay, he suggests that there's a, a, a cotton po a covered polyester thread, polycore, that's used for industrial sewing. It looks and feels okay. like cotton, but it has a similar strength of polyester. And he's kind of put, is that an option for those who are interested in more It cotton? is probably an option. I've not, I've not heard of it. Um, I just tend to buy what's locally available, to be honest, you know, rather than buying stuff online. Um, I know that some people have a real issue. I mean, obviously, I have an issue on environmental grounds with polyester because it will survive a nuclear war and it will be here forever. So when I am done with a class in my studio, I sweep up all the bits of fabric and put them in my compost heap, but not the threads. And it is awful because they are just there forever. However, you know, the alternative is hand sewing because your sewing machine just isn't strong enough to do, you know, it just can't deal with cotton threads. So, um, you know, and I'd rather use my sewing machine because that's what we're here for. <laughs> but I don't know the answer to that unless somebody comes up with a strong cotton. So, yes, maybe. But then if you've got a polyester that's covered with cotton, it's still polyester as well, isn't it? So, you know, the cotton will rot away in your compost heap and then the polyester will still be there so yeah that unfortunately it's you know i'm really into not creating waste i recycle everything and it makes me feel very guilty when i end up with a bin full of polyester threads um i wonder if there's any scope for innovation in that area i'm sure of I course I'm sure everything but i mean you know making stuff out of bamboo which is really strong or i don't know mm -hmm. spider webs or something do you know what i mean that's but i don't know if anyone cares enough right now to look into that that's part of the problem always isn't mm -hmm. it you know. Okay, that's so Sarita saying good to do a polyester cycle. Hello, scary boots. Hello, boots. Hello, Hello. 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 Hello.
I, do I have sound? Yes. Awesome. Um, I've got a really, really old uh, mechanical singer that I was given for my 10th birthday. Uh, uh, I've been using electric because tired um but also i would like to uh i'd like to refurb it and get it going again um when i try and turn it it basically doesn't turn and doesn't go down so from what you said i'm thinking to check the bobbin and the spool case yes so if it doesn't turn on. if it won't turn people presume that there's something going on at the top but actually if there's something going on in the bobbin area your whole machine won't work because it won't allow you to turn. So take the bobbin out, take the bobbin case out, and then see if it will turn. And just see what else is underneath there. Those really old machines, you can undo a little catch on the side and then tip the whole machine backwards if it's in a wooden case. It so is. They often, yeah. So undo the, the little catch and then tip the machine backwards and see what's underneath there. I found mice nests and spiderweb <laughs> and needles. And a handbook are often older people. Oh, that would be lovely. Yeah, exactly. So, but it's amazing what you find underneath there. Pins. I mean, this is why I only ever use pins with massive heads because those pins with no heads they go into your sewing machine. Uh, sequins. I mean, literally anything. I fixed someone's sewing machine yesterday, and as I opened it up, a bit of a paintbrush came out. So, have a good look underneath because something will be obstructing it, and that's probably why it's not turning. So, if it feels like a proper it won't go, then don't force it. If it feels like it's wanting to go, but it's maybe old oil with clogging it up, then what you can do is just keep oiling it and the oil, the new oil will generally go through the old oil and it will start loosening up. If it really won't go, sometimes you have to resort to WD-40 to unclog the old oil. But I find that's not usually an issue with machines that old. It's usually more of an issue with machines from the 60s, 70s, 80s the oil, they obviously used a completely different, maybe a synthetic oil, and it's clumped together and turns solid. So, but actually with really old sewing machines, that's generally not an issue. I mean, sometimes they're not used for 40 years. You put a bit of oil in and then they're good to go. So I'm sure you will have no problem getting it back onto its feet. They are so easy. Those old machines are just indestructible. And like I said, so uh, grateful <laughs> for a bit of oil and then they're off and away again. So I'm sure it'll be absolutely fine. Thank you. Cool. Great. Well, thank you. Who else have we got? For that question, Scary Boots, and we wish you luck with that project. Um, there's, uh, I believe, is, is has Sarah made it back, uh, James? Is Sarah on, able to ask um, her questions? Sarah, uh, yeah, Sarah, you should be able to ask your question with your microphone and camera if you'd like to by refreshing the page and re-entering the session. Um, so feel free to do that if you like. Anne, I've added you now, um, the right Anne, apologies for getting the wrong person before. Um, so you can now refresh and re-enter the session to ask your question if you'd like to. Um, while we're waiting, I'm just going to, um, as the, one of the session moderators, I'm going to use my privilege and um, ask, you know, uh, sewing machine, using a sewing machine was one of those things that I didn't learn from my mom, yeah. um, that I saw her doing that I really Most much people about wish I had. Like, unlike uh, balancing a checkbook, which I'm totally glad I never learned and never had to do. Um, <laughs> but um, what do you suggest for, you know, like people who are kind of coming at it as beginners and who don't necessarily yeah. want to make a huge investment, but also I'm not so keen on buying a new machine myself. No. So are there some vintage machines that are like really good for beginners or that we should be looking yeah, for? Yeah, anything pre-1960 is generally absolutely amazing because they just didn't make rubbish then. They just didn't. There was nothing to be gained by making something a bit shit. Whereas now we seem to be much more keen on selling stuff that doesn't necessarily work because, and it's heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking when people come to me with a machine they've spent a hundred quid on a hundred and fifty, and then presume it's operator error when actually it's just the machine that's rubbish. Um, but I would say with older sewing machines, I mean, nineteen eighties is where things started going a bit wrong, and some nineteen seventy five machines are a bit rubbish too. But anything older than that is generally just fine and you know you can still get all the parts for it and there's so many enthusiasts out there there's so many websites explaining how to fix each individual machine you know people have dedicated so much of their time and teaching complete strangers how to overhaul machines and how to fix timing issues and really complicated stuff there is amazing websites where people are remaking i saw a question i think from mark about some funny needles for old really old german sewing machines where they they 
you know, those needles are almost impossible to get hold of. But people are still making them. People are generally, you know, making really unique needles that, you know, hardly anyone uses that you can still get. So there's a lot of love out there for vintage sewing machines and a lot of advice and a lot of, you know, DIYers just doing it for themselves. So much more so than, you know, being able to find information on how to fix your brand new singer, actually. So, um, you know, because you're, you're kind of tapping into uh, a generation also of people that would fix everything. So, yeah, I would say definitely buy vintage, you know, buy a secondhand machine, you know, for the same money, you'll get a lot more. It's almost impossible to buy a modern machine now that is as good as a good as a normal vintage sewing machine. Wow. Um, yeah. Okay. And it looks like some of the other, sadly, some of the other people are either have, having issues with their mics and cameras. Yeah. So go ahead and just um, answer some of those questions, ask some of those questions. So from Sarah, um, she's, um, she's asking, what are some of the most common errors you find in repairing overlockers? And I know Karen um, and Danny in Australia are, <laughs> are yeah. don't necessarily like to fix overlockers because they're a lot of work. Well, it's really interesting, actually, because overlockers on the whole are much more forgiving than sewing machines, so they are much less likely to go wrong. So they look intimidating because the threading up is quite hard, but they're actually much more forgiving. They will sew with the foot down or with the foot up. Um, you can fiddle with the tension. They don't need to be really clean very often. I never clean mine. Mine lives on the floor. I cover it up when I think about it, but other times I don't. I blow the dust off and it works again. Again, you can buy an overlocker in Aldi or in Lidl. It's just not going to be very good. It might work for a bit. I read a really interesting blog post the other day about the tolerance on sewing machines when they come out of the shop, and the same goes for overlockers. Um, that, you know, if you buy something for 60, 70, 80 quid, they're literally just going to go, well, it's we've made it, and we're going to put it in a box and sell it. And they don't care whether you don't like it, because most people don't come back to them and say, well, this machine is rubbish. They just go, well, it must be me that's rubbish. And they put it back in the box and put it in the cupboard or stick it on eBay eventually. But they presume it's them and they don't understand that actually it is the machine. So, yeah, overlockers, though, on the whole, I don't get an awful lot of overlockers to fix, actually. Very occasionally, if they've been really badly mistreated, the timing might go out. But I've only recently fixed two overlockers timing. So timing is where when the needle goes down, it picks up the thread and the needle goes down at the right time to pick up the thread. Otherwise, if everything's in the wrong place at the wrong time, that's when they tell you the timing is out. Um, so on overlockers, obviously there's more needles and more loopers or whatever, but they're actually not, again, they're a bit more forgiving. So with sewing machines, it's really important that the needle goes down exactly at the right time. Whereas overlockers, they're a bit more like, yeah, that will do. You know, if it's roughly in the right place at the right time, there seems to be a bit more scope for it being ever so slightly wrong and it's still working fine. So I don't have any tips on fixing overlockers because they just don't come to me very often. But then also the funny thing with overlockers is that people buy them and then don't use them because they think they need one. And then they realize they don't. And, you know, because actually most people don't use don't really need an overlocker unless you are sewing a lot of stretchy fabrics. You know, if you're just sewing for yourself, I never overlock my stuff. I just, you know, I have an overlocker, but I'm a bit lazy, you know. In the 1950s, they didn't have overlockers. They used pinking shears, and that works just fine. So that might be why I don't fix an awful lot of overlockers. I think by the time people buy them and use them, they know how to look after the sewing machines properly. Um, so, or they just put them on eBay when they don't work anymore. I don't know. But yeah, they generally just need yeah. a bit of a clean, and then they're okay again. Okay. Yeah. Well, I see that Mark um, is saying in the chat that he's. Uh, yeah. It was a timing that knocked out, and then he fixed. Yeah. Um, exactly that, there was earlier on there was some uh there was some question about um well I, like i asked about you know what's what's a good you know machine for a beginner and um and then there was another question kind of almost like a follow-on question from that which is what are some of the um the villains the the companies that are basically churning out um garbage yeah. sewing machines that avoid? yeah I, it's a massive bugbear of mine so singer is one of the worst they apparently the brand has been bought and sold so many times in the last 10 years that nobody even really knows who makes them anymore. And they don't care about warranty. It's literally they're just churning them out to be sold. And there is just no comeback. So I know some shops that won't sell single sewing machines anymore. 
I know quite a few shops that won't fix sewing machines and singer sewing machines anymore because they're just dreadful. I mean, literally, you open them up and it's like looking at a cheap ballpoint pen. You know, they use springs that don't have the power to push the needle bar to the left and right to zigzag. But, you know, people don't know and they kind of go, oh, singer, that's great. My mum used to have a singer or my granny had a singer. And so they buy a singer in the shopping centre or in Lidl. And then, you know, they're trading on their name. Oh, and they're just, oh, it's, like, it's, it's really sad. Like, it's like, you know, Sony um, yeah. used to be in the 80s was so well known for its um, yeah. durable devices. And, and or uh, another good example yeah. is um, is actually British brand Doula. That they make a couple of toasters that yes. are highly repairable, amazing. Yeah. like tanks and they have a whole other line I've had the same disposable yeah. yeah okay that's exactly it so the other brand that's really bad at that is Brava so Brava makes um loads of really cheap nasty sewing machines and then there comes a price point above which the sewing machines are made in a different factory to a completely different standard so and I don't know what the price point is and it probably changes but it's about 300 pounds probably so you can buy a 60 quid brother that is literally not even worth it as a toy. They are awful, awful, awful. The tension comes and goes. They're not repairable. I've had ones where students have got them out of the box brand new. I've just bought this, got them out of the box for my class. And the bobbin case is broken and the tension doesn't work and the needle doesn't swing from left to right. But then you get expensive brothers and they're some of the best machines you can buy. So but where that's where it changes from rubbish to excellent nobody really knows so you can buy a 200 quid machine and it might be shit so yeah that's really it breaks my heart it really breaks my heart because people are trusting the brand and it just isn't there at all but no one's been told and you can spend 400 quid on a singer and it's still rubbish you know they just look fancier wow. now this is some singer machine which the, the one that really really pisses me off it's called a singer heavy duty and the only thing heavy duty about it is the price tag and the color, it's gray. It's not white, it's gray. So it looks industrial. And it isn't. It's just still as wow. awful. So people buy them because they think, well, with that, I can, you know, make jeans. And they just can't because they're not heavy duty. They're, you know, there's literally wow. nothing heavy duty about them. Well, thank you for calling that out. We will include that on yeah. the Twitter thread. <laughs> I, I've um, got it all there's on my website. Question. And I'm surprised they've never sued me because I'm so vocal about it. <laughs> Um, there's another question from Ellie who says she's camera shy. Um, yeah. Can you recommend a step-by-step -step guide for oiling your machine for the first time? And yeah. um, potentially related question is um, when I used my machine for a long time, the pedal, oh no, that's different. The pedal starts to smell of burning. What should ah, I do? This is a really good one. So there was a time sort of um, around about the 70s say that um they they put capacitors and i saw that earlier on on the on the main fixed fest website there is uh, a thing about capacitors so they put capacitors in the pedals and sometimes in the sewing machines and those capacitors are dying so basically when you smell your machine it's like a weird plasticky burny smell if you can smell that or you can feel that your pedal is getting hot or there's like wisps of smoke coming out of the back of your machine unplug it and and I know this is probably not great advice I tend to just remove the capacitors so I open the pedal up and just take them out and th I've never had an issue with it then becoming a problem but like, this is probably really terrible advice and I'm yeah, sure yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. you can take it to your I local repair event yeah. Yeah. This is what yeah. I do for myself but those capacitors cost like a couple of quid on eBay and you just you know they just you just replace them but if you can smell your machine it i bet you anything it's the capacitor so this is what i always say about vintage sewing machines don't leave them plugged in because when you're not there or even if you walk out of the room i once left a machine literally to go and make myself a cup of tea and i came back and it was sewing on its own because when those capacitors go it starts shorting and it basically the whole on and off thing gets bypassed and if you ignore that, yeah, so I know I, someone who just kept turning the machine off at the socket in order to stop it sewing, and she left it for ages and ages and ages until it eventually caught fire. So don't do that. Don't so don't leave your machine plugged in. Or if you get have a vintage sewing machine that's of a certain vintage, then just fix the capacitor because it will eventually pop and they literally explode. So definitely that's what's probably um, happening. So those who want to learn more about capacitors, we, we, we did a session on capacitors with Chris Muller from, uh, from Cambridgeshire Repair Cafes and we'll have a recording of that. Um, Good, I need to watch yeah. that too. I just cut mine out, but yeah. <laughs> probably not okay. very safe. Um, and then um, what, what was the 
other question? The other question was just about a step-by-step -step guide. To oh, yes. Oil oh, oiling yes. The machine. On modern sewing machines can't be oiled. They're basically just completely closed systems. So you can't get in there. There's nothing, anything, nothing you can really oil. Okay. Occasionally, what I might do is put a, put the machine on its back and put a drop of oil in the bobbin area so that it spins more freely. But other than that, there is nothing you can get to at all, and it shouldn't need it anyway. I mean, the machine will run out before the oil runs out. But on vintage sewing machines, everything is accessible pretty much. So on really old machines, you would have oiling points, and it would quite often have a little red bit of red paint around the holes in the machine, or it might have a little arrow and say oil on the black old black metal singers. Um, but if not, it usually has holes on your machine, on your vintage sewing machines, and you just put one drop of sewing machine, not anything else. I've seen people kill sewing machines with olive oil or three in one. It has to be sewing machine oil. One drop only. Don't put too much oil in because, again, it can catch fire. And I've I've, done, I've seen it happen. So don't do that. One drop of oil in each oiling point. And as to regularity, not not every day, not once every six years. So just kind of when you think about it, it won't stop working if you don't oil them. I mean, it will eventually, but it takes quite a long time. But it will absolutely purr when you do oil it. So well, yes, on vintage sewing machines, usually you can take the whole top of the machine off quite easily. Either you unscrew it or it just pops off. If it doesn't have any obvious oiling points, I put a bit of oil on everything that moves. So turn the hand wheel and you can see all the gears and the joints and the little elbows all moving and the shafts, one drop of oil on everything that moves. And you can take the side panel off usually where the needle bar is and the foot. Again, just a drop of oil on that. And if you have a really old machine that you can tip out of its wooden case, tip it backwards, then one drop of oil on all the bits underneath that as well. Um, there isn't a chart because it's different for every machine. So on some of the really old machines, it will tell you in the instructions where to oil them. Almost all vintage sewing machines, you can find the instructions for the instruction manuals online for free. So don't be tempted to pay for it. You just have a look, have a rummage. You know, again, all these lovely people put all their information online. So you should be able to find how to use your sewing machine, how to thread it up and how to oil it online if it's not super obvious. Yeah, good quality oil, not with floaties in it, definitely. <laughs> yeah, so Mark, absolutely. The okay. capacitors are for radio frequency interference suppression, still legally required for any machine sold. Exactly it. So I get it, but um, yeah, mine doesn't work. Well, mine works I'm sure that uh, happy fixers will be happy to replace those capacitors. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, Mark obviously knows his stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's another question from Coralie via email. Um, she says, I have an old genome sewing machine and I can't get the bobbin to pick up the stitch. Um, my brother bought it for me. Okay. We bought it and it showed it working, but the first time I changed it, it didn't work. Okay, so there could be various things and it could just be the standard, have you changed the needle? A blunt needle won't pick up your thread or a damaged needle won't pick up the thread. Is the needle in the right way around? If your needle is in back to front, it won't pick up the thread. Do you have the correct bobbin in there? Um, is the bobbin threaded up properly as well? So if all of those things are there, then what you might want to do is take your um, take your bobbin and the bobbin case out and turn the hand wheel. If nothing underneath the bobbin area is moving, you sh should see there's like a hook in the, you know, I'm talking about the push-in bobbins. It's a little bit more difficult to see on the others, but um, there's a hook that basically comes around. As you turn the hand wheel, it comes around and it picks up the loop of top thread and brings it around to the bobbin area. If nothing is moving, it could be that the gears are gone. And on modern sewing machines, that's almost impossible to fix. They are not easy to get hold of. They're almost impossible to get back into your machine. And it's definitely not usually economical to fix on, an, on a newer machine. On older machines, the gears are usually metal, so they don't shear off. But on anything from 1980s onwards, the plastic gears, the teeth just snap off after a while. And if you have a massive thread jam or you you break your needle on something or you're trying to force a pair of jeans through there you could actually completely wreck uh that particular bit so once oh, that's, that's gone strange. that reminds me of a lot of probably places, you know where the, the plastic yep. bag goes and it's like you know yeah so one way to look after your machine is to actually, if you can't act, if you can access, if you can see your gears, if you have a machine where you could still take the lid off and the front cover off or whatever, but they've already started using plastic, then 
um, you can get uh, what I use is a lub lubricant that I got from a car shop. Put some lubricant on there because it, it's when they dry out, as far as I'm aware, it's when they dry out that they're, they're more likely to snap. So look after your gears. But yeah, if they're completely gone, it isn't likely though. It takes quite a bit to shear the teeth off. But some of the ones that are from like 1980, the gears just spontaneously crumble and it's really quite heartbreaking. Okay, um, we have a couple more. I'm wondering, um, we have a couple more from Scary Boots. Are you are you there, Scary Boots, still? Would you like to mic on, on your mic and um, ask those questions? Um, hey, the, this was more a, a thought rather than an important question. Um, just, uh, do you think using thread lubricant might help with the cotton issue? It's the strength of it. So it's not so much that it doesn't run through the system. It's the strength of it. It just isn't very strong. And if you actually, so most sewing machines won't apply tension until you've put the foot down. But if you've got your machine threaded up and the thread through the needle, and then you put your, not the presser foot, not your human foot, you put the foot down and then pull your thread through the needle, it's almost impossible to move it. And that is how much tension is put on your thread. So cotton thread just generally isn't very strong. But I'm sure it can be fixed by, you know, twisting it tighter or what have you. And there probably is alternatives out there. But, um, yeah, but it's not it's not the lubricant so much. I mean, I do use that when I hand sew with with threads um, so it doesn't tangle. But it's more that it's just not very strong. Mm. Uh, and then otherwise it was just that there's been a lot of a lot of good things shared about sewing machine brands and which ones are good and thoughts and stuff. Is there anywhere this is kind of captured and written down or is that like a legal potentially issue? <laughs> well, I don't even think these brands care one bit, to be honest. If they cared, they would do something about it, wouldn't they? I mean, one brand that I still, still absolutely love is Genome. So Genome is a brand that is consistently good. I've never come across a rubbish Genome. They seem to be, you know, considering they're still cheap. So I buy my sewing machines for my classes in um, John Lewis, and they're called John Lewis, but they're made by Genome, and they're 100 quid. And they're, you know, for modern sewing machines, they're virtually indestructible. So that is That's definitely reassuring. Good. Yeah, really good. And Genome, you know, Hobbycraft sells them for, like, next to nothing, and, you, you know... So they and they are good, whether the cheap ones or the more expensive ones. But yeah, mm -hmm. there's lots of others where um, if it's a brand you don't know, there's brands like Silver and uh, all kinds. You know, ones like I said, don't buy don't buy your sewing machine in the place where you also buy your vegetables. Is always my kind of motto. <laughs> Fair, thank you. Or idea, yeah. Right, we've got someone else there. Do you have? Do you Hi, Ron. Right. Um, I'm just going to show you something here. Oh, beautiful. Is that a singer? It is. Where's it, where's it gone? Um, I'm wondering, yeah. Jenny, no, I fixed it. As, uh, they have a listing of repairability. Of, um, they started with tablets and laptops. But I'm wondering okay, whether yeah. um, in the sewing community... Well, it's not something that most people really talk about. And I don't really, I only know one other person that fixes sewing machines. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm not sort of aware of of, um, of other people that do this and have don't have conversations with them. I would say generally anything old is totally repairable and most new things aren't. I mean, you can't even get into most modern sewing machines without snapping the plastic case off. Um, I was told by a sewing machine repair shop local to me that say for example brother will tra train their engineers on how to open the casing and they charge a, a thousand pounds on this like day-long training course but the majority of the course is how to get the casing off because they're not they're put on by robots and you can't really take them off anymore so but yeah repairability anything old is generally completely repairable and anything that was bought in the last 15 years generally just isn't not even if it's cost you a grand I mean, I bought, I bought, once had a very expensive sewing machine. It cost me a thousand pounds and it was the worst sewing machine I've ever owned. It was, you know, so fancy. It was all computerized. I had all these sensors about, you know, it would tell you when the bobbin was empty and it would tell you when this was happening. And actually it meant it never worked because it was so oversensitive. It was just an absolute prima donna. So yeah, unfortunately. Well, How long I was trying sewing? to find out the, the sorry. Yeah. I was trying to find out uh, the approximate age of this machine. Uh, okay. I'm just, uh, trying to repair it at the moment. 
Uh, is it a metal one? Germany. It's like a baby blue metal one. It's a metal yeah. one, yes. I uh, would say mid sixties. Uh, and it's sixties, yeah. It's yeah. a very good machine. You can get access everywhere. They're absolutely um, amazing. They're all metal inside. I, yeah, I've, I've cleaned everything and re-oiled everything. Yep. Uh, it's just trying to get the tensions right. That's my problem. Tensions on the so, bobbin and the tension of, of the, the thread. Yes. So if you start by putting your top tension on four, that is generally the kind of average tension, and then adjust your bobbin tension to fit. Rather than if you keep okay. fiddling with both, you'll never really get there. But if you keep tension on four and then adjust your bobbin tension until it stops. If your bobbin tension is too tight, it pulls too much of the top thread through to the bottom and you get loops underneath. And if your bobbin tension is too loose, you might get loops on the top. So that's that's right. where to start. Okay. So just adjust it a little bit, put your bobbin back in, do a bit of sewing and just keep going until you get there. Gotcha. Okay. I and if it, little, I mean, sometimes the bobbin case disaster. just needs to stay thing if it's really, you know, the screw might have gone lame or what have you, but it should be all right. Okay. Thanks for that. Machines, though. Yeah. Back. Back, to the, back to the drawing board. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Bye. So someone has asked how long the sewing machine will last. Mine, my pot of oil came with the heirloom machine. I don't really know, to be honest. I, you know, I think once it's gone dark orange, I tend to throw it away. But, you know, I mean, I don't know is the official answer. Um, um, but I tend to just use it for as long as I can. And maybe it just goes a bit gloopier when it's really old. I, I don't really know. But, yeah, if it's really, really dark orange, I'd say that it's probably not okay anymore. But 10 years is probably fine. Right, anything else? A genome JD 1822. Any idea what year this was manufactured? I have no idea. I mean, it's often difficult to find that. Kind of yeah, if you scroll down, uh, Mark's got an answer there. Um, and it looks like, um, is it true, uh, Jenny, that like that service manuals are a bit of an issue with sewing machines, like other appliances yeah. that, that we try to fix? Oh, oh, oh. If you if you bought a sewing machine in the 1940s, it would give you the operation manual and then it would also give you the service manual with it because, of course, everyone was expected to just look after their own stuff. And now they're probably like gold dust. I mean, it's really, really, really hard. You know, I've, I've been trying to fix this, you know, modern sewing machine. It's probably five years old and there was just this bit that had pinged off um, and it's completely impossible to find out anything at all because of course you know i think the thing to remember is that the people that post stuff on their blogs or on their websites about how to repair stuff are generally not people that are interested in fixing white plastic machines they're the you know they're the people with the vintage cars and the vintage sewing machines because they're much more satisfying to have a play with they're much more interesting they're much more likely to be fixed and then these are the people that also will then write on their blog you know i've just fixed this beautiful 1945 sewing machine Whereas, you know, you just can't get that information on modern sewing machines. I mean, to be honest, you know, once you've repaired one, they're, you know, they're, they're kind of all the same on the inside. There isn't anything really unique about the inside of modern sewing machines necessarily. Um, but yeah, if you need to find something really specific about where this spring came from, well, you just can't. Yeah. And is they there just, is that really it's a, is there like a kind of would you say that there's like one online knowledge base for for sewing machines that people could go to or look for help? Not definitely not for modern sewing machines. And I think it's all. I mean, this is all just you know, vol, you know, a whole bunch of volunteers all over the world, fanatics that are you know, you know, lots of people just repair and don't go online and talk talk about it. But of course, then some people do. So there is a fount of information, but it's not all in one place. You know, I found there is a there is a few places. There's a few you know, there's a few places where they. Um, I can't remember what it's called now. I think it's ismac.net is uh, an absolute fount of information on Singer sewing machines. So they, th this guy has been repairing for Singer sewing machines for like 40 years and he loves them and he's written up a whole history of them. And also if you put in your old Singer sewing machine um, uh, uh, serial number, it tells you exactly where it was made and when it was made, literally to the month, which is phenomenal. Um, there's an awful lot of information about which model is better than what model and what the difference is between this serial number and that serial number. But it's all just down to individual enthusiasts. So there isn't one cohesive 
place to find everything you need, unfortunately. And also, you know, stuff differs all over the world. So singer sewing machines in this country are awful, but I think in America they're actually all right. They're made in different factories, you know, and they're made by different companies even. So they're just called the same. So you can't even just say that it's across the board, this is a great make or not, or how to fix that. Okay, and I just wanted to jump in quickly. Uh, just, to, just to say, uh, Jan, I think we've got a question from Jane uh, that's been waiting for a little bit. Oh, thank you, Mark. Oh, thank you. It's just, yeah. Um, Jane, I, th I think um, we have uh, just to ask you a question. Uh, Jane asks, uh, she has a new home that's over 25 years old now, yep. but the reverse lever doesn't make it reverse since she had it serviced no. a couple of years ago. That's, that's quite a common thing. So new home don't exist anymore. They were taken over by Genome. I'm not sure when, maybe 90s or so. So new home sewing machines are excellent, totally excellent machines. But the reverse button is not an unusual thing for that. Just stop working. So if you can take it apart, it just depends on how much you enjoy this kind of stuff because I love it. So I just kind of go, well, that bit works and that bit doesn't. So the bit in the middle has to be the problem. So I just kind of wriggle and poke. And as long as you don't go in with a hammer, or with a massive screwdriver, if you just wriggle and gently poke and just follow the line of, you know, this moves and then this goes into this bit here and then that's supposed to, you know, press that lever down, you can often figure out where the reverse lever is no longer connecting. It might be that a spring has become detached, but it could also be that it's just, you know, when they serviced your machine, they knocked something and it's just needs to be knocked back into place. Um, it's difficult to say without looking at it. Um, but if you're confident to just have a go, I mean, like I said, as long as you're gentle and sensitive, you're not going to break it. You know, th this is all stuff that is meant to be, you know, kind of handled in those older machines. So don't be rough with it and you'll probably just have a go. And if not, give me a call. We can do it by Zoom or what have you, because um, I'd love for it to work again. But it's generally really easily fixed. It's just something that's got knocked out of place or, you know, uncoupled from something else. Right, I've got a question here from Penn. Who does sewing machine motor men? Yes, I don't, because <laughs> I don't do electrics. I don't understand them at all, uh, as you could tell by my whole thing about capacitors. Um, there are places that do. Um, there is a sewing machine shop in Ilford. So I noticed that you're in London. There's a sewing machine shop in Ilford where they will replace motors. Um, I have no idea how much they charge for such a thing. And for a lot of you know, cheaper machines, it won't be economical. If they're going to charge you 90 quid to fix a motor on a 100 pound sewing machine, unfortunately, it's just, you know, easier to just chuck them away. But on older sewing machines, if you have a really old sewing machine, so Singer used to sell hand crank sewing machines. And then when you came into some money or you saved up a little bit more, you could buy a motor for it and just bolt it onto the back. And um, so you can convert a hand crank to a pedal or tre to a treadle machine or to a motor. And on the older sewing machines, um, you know, whether they were a new home or, or a singer or a, a brother or whatever, they all had the same motors that were made by this company called Tri Track, I think. So the motor just bolts onto the back. So you just you can buy a new motor on eBay for 30 quid, just, you know, disconnect the old one, connect the new one up and Bob's your uncle. But um, on newer ones, it's not that simple. It's finding the parts as well. It's just not always that straightforward that you can find your bits and bobs. Right. I'm um, noticing that um, yeah, James has shared in the chat that we have um, uh, a listing of independent repair businesses and isn't repair businesses in London. Um, James, do we have? Do we have listings of sewing machine repair though? I'm actually- There isn't very I'm many. Just... I mean, I... There, is, there is one sewing uh, repair shop okay. yeah, on, in the directory. They're probably Tony's sewing center. And then that's something we yeah, should well, explore. They call yeah. Tony's sewing, sewing center. Was okay. Name. So I mean, a lot of them don't exist anymore. Unfortunately, there's, you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, chaps in their eighties that would just come to your house and fix sewing machines and they're no longer doing it, but it is, Oops, I um I don't know about you. I just lost Jenny. I hope she uh, makes it back. <laughs> um, so yeah, a couple of people are asking about um, where all these links will be shared. Um, we have a notes a collaborative notes file that's been shared in the chat. If you scroll up a little bit, um, Vanessa's just shared that. And if 
if those who've been sharing links in the um, in the chat wouldn't mind just hopping over and sharing the link on the collaborative notes, that would be amazing. Oh, you're back. I'm back. I don't know what happened. I had to completely look back in. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, there just isn't very many people doing it. I guess there's not an awful lot of money in it. I've I've come across sewing machine repair shops that go just throw it away and buy a new one from me, which is heartbreaking. You know, why are you still using that old crap? Um, but there's obviously there is people like me that just love it and wants everybody to keep sewing. But I've got a lot of business. It's you know it really, especially right now, I'm that's all I'm doing is fixing sewing machines, and I would love more people to do it. So if you want to learn how to fix sewing machines. I'll show you. <laughs> I'll empower you to spread the love. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, it, it looks like some people can't hear you James? in the chat, Janet. Um, if, if, you, if you can't hear Janet, it's can because you write I'm using Firefox. Uh, yeah, I'm using Firefox and it appears it doesn't like um, Firefox. Why don't uh, you speak then? I, you want to wrap up session? I, I installed Chrome specifically for this. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, I can. I can uh, perhaps take it from here. Do we have any other questions left in the queue? Um, maybe someone couldn't post in the chat. I I'm just having a little reason. rummage through the chat. Let's have a look. Um... Da, 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 da. Oops. It keeps flipping back to the bottom of the chat, unfortunately. I think every time someone posts, it goes to the bottom, yeah. Yeah. Some nice comments, uh, one from Sandy, very useful session, been fixing machines in a workshop in two hospitals in Malawi last yeah, year. Yeah, amazing. I mean, a yeah. lot of them, a lot of, especially hand crank sewing machines um, are being used in, um, in places where the electricity just isn't consistent or non-existent completely because they're so reliable, you know, they just require you to work um so i do know a lot of people that collect not a lot of people i know people that collect them and ship them out to africa for example which is fantastic because you know to be able to sew without electricity is fabulous um yeah great um i'm just scanning see if there are any more da, 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 da. yeah if you've got any final questions for jenny feel free to put them in the chat we do have a bit more time oh here's one from pen can you see that Jen jenny can scissors be sharpened? Yes. Not zigzag, not um, pinking shears. I've never found that. I have got the cheapest, nastiest looking little gadget for fixing my, um, sharpening my scissors. It's just a piece of black plastic. It was, oh, who is it made by now? I think it might be Prim, P-R-Y-M, not 100% sure. It cost me like seven quid and you, but it sharpens your scissors. It's phenomenal. I mean, not, um, not pinking shears. I think once they're dead, they're dead. Um, but that, that thing, it absolutely works. You put your scissors in it and then you kind of make a cutting motion and it sharpens your scissors, So, um, which is fantastic. Uh, definitely really good. I mean, I've stopped. My first pair of sewing shears cost me 35 quid back in 1994, which was obviously phenomenal amount of money. And they are just about the worst scissors I have. So now I just buy them, you know, 12 quid ones and they're much better quality. I think we've got more access to decent, cheaper scissors um and as long as you make sure that nobody in your household cuts you know wire or silver foil or paper with them um they should last a fair amount of time before they need sharpening um so somebody's saying also roller blades i presume she means rotary cutters yeah i use rotary cutters almost exclusively for pattern cutting it's much much easier they're much more maneuverable you can go through six layers of fabric in one go much more accurate as well um i think you can sharpen them but i've never tried um, but they tend to last, if you don't go over pins or what have you, they tend to last quite long anyway. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, Mark points out that there are some repair cafes and other repair groups that do sharpen things like scissors yeah. and stuff. But I um, would definitely so say that this is a gadget. Nice. I just bought it on the dreaded Amazon and it, it's been an absolute <laughs> lifesaver when it comes to not having to throw your scissors away. It just is so easy to use. Um, yeah, more plan probably sells them too. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Uh, some well, good recommendations good. from people. Really nice how much knowledge is out there as well, other people that, you know, know stuff. It's so nice to connect. Yeah. Uh, looks like there's a question from Lucy who asks, um, have you noticed an increase in demand to fix sewing machines in light of uh, the new generation of indie pattern makers? 
Yes, absolutely. It all goes hand in hand. I mean, there was a time where, you know, I used to joke with people that to admit that you knitted back in the 90s was akin to knit, admitting you took heroin. In fact, it was probably more socially acceptable to take drugs than it was. <laughs> and, but now it's amazing. You know, there's all these like 25 year olds that come to my classes and they're all designing their own patterns and they're just having a go. And, you know, lots of people. And it's like Janet said, it's almost skipped a generation where people of my generation Mum knows how to sew, but she still won't let me touch her sewing machine because she thinks I'm going to break it. And they didn't pass it on. And I've had, you know, almost, you know, debates with people that don't want their girls to learn how to sew because it's, you know, it's seen as menial and they want their girls to be doctors and lawyers instead. And da, 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 da. But I think everyone should know how to sew because it's just a phenomenal skill to have, even if you can just repair your clothes or what have you. But, yeah, it's definitely, it's all gone hand in hand, the whole upsurge in, people fixing sewing machines and buying sewing machines. And, you know, someone came to me yesterday with a machine she'd inherited from her grandmother. I'd say she was in her early 20s. And she, you know, she's just been making stuff all through lockdown, just having a go at stuff. Um, fabric shops are, you know, increasing. There's loads more of them. And the indie pattern designers are making make my heart sing. They're amazing. Because it's the same kind of quality issue that you get in patterns as you get with sewing machines where, the big pattern companies, they bring up patterns and then no one ever checks them whether they work or whether the instructions are clear. They just don't care. They sell them in great volume and nobody ever complains about them. Whereas the indie pattern designers, every pattern has been lovingly slaved over and it's been extensively tested because their whole reputation is hanging on this. And so by the time they release a pattern, you know that it's gone through a really thorough testing process and it works and the instructions are clear and there's we've got color photos and they might have a, you know a blog that tells you you know how to do specific things and they are all about the love of sewing and sharing information rather than selling information it's all about no i do this and i want you to be able to do it too so there's an awful lot of free information out there you know, holding your hand on how to do stuff, how to put invisible zips in or, or how to adjust patterns to fit you. So, yeah, there is an awful lot of amazing people out there doing really great stuff. Yeah. Um, yay for indie patterns, indeed. So Karen asks for links. I can put links in later. There's absolutely tons of them. One of my favourite is Tilly and the Buttons. She, I think she won the sewing bee years ago now, and she's got this phenomenal company making beautiful patterns. I used them in my classes um, because the patterns work, they fit. They are, the instructions are clear. Um, you know, I just don't have any complaints about it at all. So that's definitely one. Thanks, James, for putting that in there. Um, uh, yeah, that's one of the pattern companies I use an awful lot. And she's local as well. I mean, as in she's, you know, I think she might be in London. She's definitely British. So, you know, our, what what we wear here might be quite different from what they'd like to wear in America or, or, or whatever, Australia. So, you know, she's very on point. She's young, she's fresh, she's exciting. And she gets it. She gets also how bodies work and how, you know, when bodies get bigger, it doesn't necessarily mean you get taller, for example, but that things happen in different places in your body and that her patterns are completely adjustable for different sizes, which is, you know, they're very inclusive. So, yeah, hurrah for Tilly and the Buttons. But there's loads more. There is, you know, there is loads out there. Um, they tend to be quite active on social media. So you go on Instagram and, and have a little rummage for pattern designers. And it's quite, it's a really amazing community as well very supportive of each other it's not very competitive people are really kind to each other and yeah yeah <laughs> scary boots so many clothes that cut off circulation to your arms yeah or that give you a mono boob or you know that you know they fit on top but it doesn't fit on your bum or whatever it's such an issue which is why i make my own clothes you know it's totally gorgeous to be able to see your body as a series of measurements rather than a series of problems you know rather than just like oh, i don't fit into this because i'm fat just go i don't fit into this because i've not made it correctly so yeah definitely hurrah for making your own <laughs> um some really good recommendations from ruth and rosamond yeah. to recommend others and um, like closet case deer and doe helen's closet friday pattern company alice and co patterns um Excellent. so lots of amazing recommendations for people from people in the chat um, yeah, and David has shared a link to a scissors sharpener. Yeah, fantastic. Good stuff. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's amazing. I was really hoping that this would be a great interactive session, and it's turned out to be exactly that. So, yay. Cool. If anyone has any further questions for uh, Jenny, we've still got Jenny for another 10 minutes or so. So feel free to get them in now while you can. Um, 
Yes, thank you, Ruth, for all those that. suggestions. They're all amazing. Closet gaze patterns are some of my favourite patterns ever, and they do sew-alongs, and then they leave all the stuff up on their blog post, so they teach you how to make swimsuits and jeans that actually fit, and they tell you exactly how to sew, you know, seams and jeans, which is quite hard, and how to put all the iron wear into your jeans. So, yeah, they're phenomenal, and, you know, yeah, great stuff. I'd like to sew with more recycled fabrics. Absolutely. Um, so this is a question from either Sarah or Sarah. I'd like to sew more with recycled fabrics. You have patterns or ideas for reusing old garments. Um, I think the big thing with reusing garments is if you find bigger garments that have bigger pieces of fabric, then they're obviously eminently more usable than little ones. If you have lots of seams and darts or tiny little scraps of fabric, they're going to be much harder to sew with. Um, I don't. I don't get time to make an awful lot of clothes, but I and I when I do, I tend to just go with a fresh piece of fabric because it saves a lot of time. Um, but uh, as we've just seen on the sewing bee, you can do amazing stuff with recycled fabrics. Um, I think the thing is to not worry too much about the weave and not worry too much about stuff like that or whether the fabrics officially go together. Just have a pop, just have a go. I mean, you could potentially patchwork your fabrics together first so that you have a nice flat piece of fabric to work from or you could just cut each pattern piece from a different item of clothing so but the thing is like i said just try and find stuff that doesn't have too many cuts or seams or poppers or anything in it um yeah should you put your foot down when storing sewing machine apparently so yes i i don't always get you know do it but if you leave the foot up when you're storing your sewing machine you, you the spring is basically con you know condensed and so that isn't very good for it eventually. But, um, you know, I think you'd have to leave it for, you know, maybe a year before it really becomes an issue. So <laughs> I use my machines too often for it to really matter. Right, what have we got? An old industrial sewing machine that tries to sew up my arm. It makes a grumpy noise. Yeah. Industrial sewing machines are a breed apart. They are quite ferocious. But once you've got the hang of them, they are so lovely because they're so forgiving they're so they're so much less fussy than um domestic sewing machines so you know i do always say to people when you go out and buy a sewing machine don't be tempted by the ones that do the alphabet or that have 600 stitches because you won't use them you will use a straight stitch and a zigzag and that's probably it so um you know that's why vintage sewing machines are great because that's pretty much all they do um yeah just a follow-up there from sandy who asks whether that noise is the capacitor possibly um in the industrial machine no don't think so it's just a massive motor that weighs more than the sewing machine so you turn it on and it goes because it's just working so yeah that's that's what you hear it's quite a soothing noise not for your neighbors though <laughs> <laughs> great um okay well this has been really really informative uh, we've been trying to keep notes uh, as best we can um over on the link i just put in the chat um, so if there's anything we've missed, and there is, because I haven't been able to keep yes. um, keep up with my typing, feel free to add in anything I've missed there. Um, anyone yeah. can add to those. And obviously, um, in the notes, it's got my email address on there, and it's got my website on there. And I'm so into, you know, this is not about making money. This is about helping people. And so just ping me a message, or if you want any advice on buying a sewing machine, even if you want to send me a picture of something you've seen on eBay, is it worth this amount of money or is that easy to fix then just please get in touch because i love helping people get decent sewing machines and get sewing machines that work and get old sewing machines back on their feet so please don't hesitate to email me um just be aware that i don't always reply straight away but <laughs> brilliant um there's a question from kate who says she's struggling to get the right tension uh the leg tension right sewing leggings yeah yeah, I mean, basically, if you're sewing a stretchy fabric on a domestic sewing machine, they're just they're not going to be massively happy. So it doesn't always the stretchier the fabric is, the harder it is for the fabric not to stretch whilst you're sewing. Um, I don't think that's probably what she means. She's probably means. So if you have a really elastic fabric, what happens? So I was talking to someone yesterday about thick sewing um, uh, swimsuit, for example, and I've also made my own bras and the, the fabric it's got so much kind of plasticky, rubbery stuff in it that as your needle goes into the fabric, it almost gets slowed down by the rubber. It gets gripped and it's, it's, so what you need is a special needle, which is almost Teflon coated. So these needles are called Microtex and they are just super, super, super glidey needles. So that's what you need. If you find that your needle is 
causing issues, it's skipping stitches, for example, on a on a stretchy or an elastic fabric, then try a microtex needle. Um, that definitely helps with the tension, I found, uh, uh, you know, the tension and actually forming the stitches. Great. Um, okay, perfect. Uh, so it's, we've only got about five minutes left, so it's probably time to start wrapping up. Um, sure. Any last minute questions? We might have time for one more, but get them in quick. <laughs> um, so, and while we're waiting have for we that. Have uh, Janet, by the way? Have we completely lost her? So people are having trouble hearing Janet. I think, yeah. Janet, are you still around? I think Janet's no, still I'm... here, but has probably just turned off her video and microphone. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, which is a shame, but um, that's the, the her, her internet connection hasn't been great today. Yeah, I sure. Think. I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? We're all struggling, yeah. like trying to do everything online when actually well, we're not exactly. set up for. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday. She teaches at a, she teaches graphic design at a university, and they've all had to go online, but the university is refusing to give people computers and broadband and all that stuff they're like yeah we're hearing you but they're not really hearing you they're just like we're expecting you to just do all this stuff with whatever you have lying around just make it up as you go along it doesn't work like that, <laughs> that <does not. laughs> no. um, okay well a, a massive thanks jenny for coming along and, that's right it's been um, my pleasure entirely yeah it's been really really useful really informative answered all um, kinds of really good questions yeah um the notes are, are in the link uh, and yeah, thank you everyone else for coming along and joining us. Yeah, this thanks morning. everyone, and, and thanks Janet and James for sorting this out and hooking up, hooking me up with everyone and connecting and stuff. And yeah, I, I hope we can, you know, all keep this conversation about repairing stuff going because it's so important. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and speaking of, that's a beautiful segue, Jenny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> into the next bit, which is just to say that um, FixFest is still going. Um, we're coming to the end now, but there are still a number of sessions left, as Janet mentioned this morning, uh, or earlier this morning. So uh, next session is on Thursday, which is our Lightning Talks Demos Show and Tell session. This is often, um, when we do offline events, one of the most fun sessions that, that mm. we do, where anyone can come up and spend five minutes talking about something they've been working on, a favorite tool, or oh, whatever fantastic. it is. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, it's normally great fun. Um, so do come along to that, everybody. And if you're interested in presenting something, um, having five minutes to talk about what it is you're working on, yeah. just get in touch with us at fixfest at the restartproject.org. Maybe someone can post that in the chat. Uh, and then we can set that up. Um, and then the session after that is also really exciting. We're hearing from our friends in Belfast about how to tell the story of repair and get people excited about repair yeah. and enthusiastic. And, yeah. and that will be a really, really great session. And then finally, there's a session on data uh, on the 9th of July, which sounds might not sound appealing to everybody, but trust me, it's going to be really cool, really interesting. Yes. We've got some cool okay. things to share, so do come along. Um, and finally, a big thanks to uh, Nesta DCMS for sponsoring um, FixFest this year. Not sponsoring, but making it happen in a financial sense. Uh, just have to get that in. Perfect. Any, any final words from anybody before we start wrapping up? And Jenny shows her machine room. I'm not actually in my machine room. I, I have about 25 sewing <laughs> machines. I'm not in my studio because the internet's a bit poor in there. So this is my main baby. This is my absolute tried and joy. Let's see if I can turn the computer around without unplugging it. I mean, I have loads of vintage sewing machines. I have a vintage, uh, I have a 1930s. So this is my, it looks like um, Knight Rider from... Uh, from you know that night oh. turn it on look it's got like red lights that come <laughs> up and that, you know night rider did that ziggy zaggy thing with its with its headlights didn't it Pylon in the machine yeah. exactly so this is an absolute bargain i found it for 75 quid on gum tree i have no idea where it came from it was a bit rusty on the outside but effectively they still go for about 700 quid on ebay they are i mean i dread the day it will die and it will because it's from the 1980s and it's got a, a motherboard inside that will go and it won't be fixable but in the meantime i just adore this machine but i have machines from 1930s and i have them from 1960s and i use all machines for different purposes so even though this is super heavy duty if i'm fixing jeans i do that on a machine that's from the 1960s because 
you know, I don't want to kill this machine over something as heavy duty as that. But yeah, unfortunately, I can't show you them all because they're spread all over the house. I have 12 sewing machines in my living room at the moment. And my living room is tiny because I've been fixing them all. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> if the machine does break, Jenny, if the motherboard finally goes, let us know and like yes. we'll put out a bat signal and get our repairers. In yeah, yeah, that'd be amazing. Get it working again. I'm sure it's doable, but that's well beyond what I can do. <laughs> Cool. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, well, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for coming, everybody. Mm -hmm. This has been good. There will be a recording going up at some point. Bear with us. Cool. Um, and we'll share that when it does. Fantastic. Bye, guys. Have a great Saturday. Bye, Bye everybody.